Good morning, y'all. Good to have you guys with us today. Uh, Merry Christmas, if I haven't said it yet. And uh, my name is Derek, and I lead our church here. Uh, so glad you're here. If it's your first time, love to meet you before you take off today. Uh, if you have a Bible, we're going to open it up to John chapter 1. Uh, we're talking about this idea of the things, the beautiful things that come with Jesus' arrival, uh, when Jesus arrives uh, on planet Earth, and, and the launching point for this series is what we're using in John chapter 1, this poem that John writes uh, at the beginning of his gospel, and so last week we talked about this idea of Jesus being the light from the very beginning of the world. And that uh, he's the one that's sustaining it all. He's the one kind of reigning over it all. Uh, that we can have hope in him no matter how dark our days get because Jesus is the light that has not, uh, cannot, and will not be overcome. And so today we turn our attention to the fact that in him is life. That in him is life. So have your Bibles, John chapter 1, reading those same verses we read last week. It says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What, uh, what, is John, what is John saying here when he says, in him is life, and that life is the light of men? Well, I think there are going to be three distinct things, at least that I pick up on, uh, that I'm going to tackle one by one, okay? So that's kind of where we're headed. The first one is, in him was life, and that life was the light of all men. I think that can simply refer to the first act of creation, talked about this a little bit last week, about when, when light was spoken into existence by the word, by the breath, by the ruach, Elohim, the spirit of God um, in Genesis 1, all leads up to that point in creation where God is building a world that is, that is fixed on this idea of the existence of human life and human flourishing. It's really interesting on day two, I don't know if you know this, but on day two uh, is the only day that nothing is declared good by God. Uh, he doesn't make a declaration of goodness on day two. He does on all the other days, but not on day two. And it's really interesting, at least in my reading of Genesis 1, when I read Genesis 1, I'm like, why did he not say day two was good? Uh, <laughs> and so I started kind of trying to figure this out. And, and, uh, and I, there aren't, honestly, very many good explanations to this. And so I don't know that the, the, the explanation that I will give you is any better. But, um, but the most compelling explanation that I have found is that the reason the reason why uh, God didn't declare anything as good on day two is simply because there was nothing created on day two that led to human flourishing. And I think that that's compelling given where Genesis 1 leads to, the creation of man and, um, and the man being the ultimate created thing in all of creation to rule and reign and have dominion uh, with God over the earth. But, um, but I don't know. We'll have to ask God whenever we get to heaven why he didn't declare uh, anything as good on day two. Um, but let's get back to John real quick. Because I mentioned last week in passing that this idea, it would seem that Jesus is sustaining, the, is the kind of the sustaining force that enables life to exist at all. And it, at the beginning, this is what we see, that without Jesus, there is no life at all. Without the breath of God, without the word of God, there is no existence of life at all. It is his breath and it is his word that is the originator of all existence. So the first thing that John seems to be communicating is that without Jesus, nothing would have life. That Jesus is life, and in him is found life. But, um, but there is so much more about this idea that in Jesus there is life found in, in the book of John. In John uh, chapter 10, Jesus makes a declaration uh, and says that I have come to give you life and give it abundantly. Some say life to the full. 
Um, but, but this idea of Jesus coming to give life. This word life is the word zoe in Greek. It's where I name my daughter after. Uh, zoe, if you know Zoe, you know she's full of life, and that's, she's living up to her name, and so that's great. But we, we, the, the, name, the word zoe in Greek, it just means life. It's, it's, it's the word used for life, and there are three words that the Greeks use for life. This is the one that meant like living existence as opposed to death, which we'll come back to in a second why this word is so important. In John 14, Jesus is about to leave his disciples, and he's about to go to the cross, and he tells them, my father has a mansion with many rooms, and I'm going to prepare a place for you, and you know how to find it. And one of his disciples, Thomas, pipes up and goes, whoa, 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 whoa. How, how are we supposed to know how to find you? Because you haven't told us where you're going. And I love Thomas, right? Thomas is just always so, so full of doubt. Uh, and he's like, well, we, how are we supposed to know? You know? And Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And what Jesus is saying is that when you find, you'll, you, you, you'll find the Father's house by following me. I'm the way to the Father's house. And don't let anyone take you down another path. That is not the true path. That is only a path that's going to lead to destruction and death. The true path, which I am, will lead you to life. That is what Jesus is declaring in John 14, 6. But why does it seem like Jesus and John are so bent and so fascinated on communicating this idea of life to people who are already living? Can you you understand this? Right? Like, this is a question that came to mind. Why would they be so bent on communicating this idea of life to people who are walking around, living and breathing people? (laughs) Well, first, it's because we will all eventually die. I'm sorry to be sad and morbid during Christmas, but you are all going to die one day. And, uh, And Jesus says in John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though they die, yet he shall live. Jesus is referring to a physical death, but an eternal and spiritual life that we are given when we put our faith in him, which is the second reason why they talk about Jesus being the life, is because without Christ, we are dead spiritually. We are dead spiritually, and it's only Jesus who can give us life. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we were dead in our transgressions in sins. Can I, uh, does anybody know what the word dead means? It means we're dead. All right, uh, that's what it means. It means we don't have any, any life. We can't do anything we, uh, in and of our own selves. But uh, Paul communicates this in Romans chapter 3. He says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this is a condition of every human being who's walked on earth except for Jesus. Romans 5 tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us to demonstrate his love. To demonstrate his love, he died for us while we were still sinners. This is just such a beautiful thing, right? And we didn't didn't magically figure out something that made Jesus want to die for us. He chose to die for us because he loved us, even while we were still sinners. And then in Romans 6, Paul says, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we find out we're spiritually dead because of our sin, Our sin is what causes us to be spiritually dead. We've all got this problem, and yet Jesus, in his love, died for all of us, even while we had this problem, and he gives us a gift of grace and eternal life. And so we are dead because of our sin, and we're separated from the light and the life that is in Christ because of our sin, but in Christ we can find new life. Ephesians 2 continues in verse 3. It says, We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive in with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages 
he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he, which he God, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, the gift of grace, the gift that um, Paul talked about and the gift that uh, in, in Romans and also in Ephesians, the gift of grace is the gift of eternal life. And you didn't do anything in order for God to be willing to offer it to you. He offers you this gift just because he loves you. And yet it is an offer. He doesn't make you pick it up. He doesn't make you accept it. It is a free gift, and he offers it to you. But we still have to pick it up. We still have to accept it. So how do we do that? How do we do that? How do we accept this life, this gift of grace? We follow Jesus. Because he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. How one is called to express their faith and show that they uh, have chosen to follow Jesus is to repent. And that is to turn away. That's just what that means. It just means turn around. That's what the word repent means. And so uh, most of us, before we decide to follow Jesus, we're headed down a different path than the one Jesus was going down. Uh, this is what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 7 when he says many are on the wide road and it leads to destruction and, and many will find it. But there is a narrow road and few will find it. And he's saying turn around and find the narrow road. Turn around and go down a different path. The road less traveled and follow Jesus. And we have enough faith Right? That's what Ephesians 2 talks about. It talks about the fact that we are saved by grace through faith. We have to believe enough in Jesus that he actually is the way, that he actually is the truth, that he actually is the life. We have to have enough faith to turn around and say, I'm going to go in his direction. And then he loves us in that space. And he saves us in that space. And so literally, many of us either have done this or will have to do this if we want to find this life that only comes in Jesus. We must turn around. And the best way to draw a line in the sand and really say, like, I've chosen to follow Jesus, no turning back. The best way to do that, put your foot in the ground and say, like, I'm, I'm not going to follow anyone else or anything else. I'm just, I'm following Jesus for the rest of my life. The best way to draw that line in the sand is through baptism, is to be baptized. See, baptism is a symbol, we're told, that is representative of dying to our old life so that we may walk in a new life. And so when we choose to follow Jesus, this is why baptism is so closely connected to almost every conversion experience that we hear about in the New Testament. When we hear someone is following Jesus or desires to follow Jesus or has heard the gospel and really wants to now be a disciple, they turn and then they're baptized. This is why they do it. It's because of what Paul says in Romans 6. And go back to Romans 6. We were there just a little bit ago, but here's a different part of Romans 6. At the very beginning, uh, Paul starts this chapter by saying, shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound, right? This free gift that God has given. Shall we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? He says, by no means. We should not do that. We shouldn't just keep sinning because we think that God's grace is going to cover that. Like that's not showing an actual true changed heart or changed life. He says, he says did you not know? That all who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. What did Jesus' death do? If you don't know, Jesus' death 
On the cross was the atoning payment for your and I's sin. It paid for our problem called sin, the thing that separated us from God. And so when we are baptized, we put ourselves in that death. We cover ourselves with that death to say it covers us. It is our payment. That's what Paul is saying here. When we are buried with him in baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too may walk in what? Newness of life. It's the idea of leaving the old life and walking into a new one. There's no better way to draw that line in the sand and say, I have turned to follow Jesus than to be baptized. To turn away from your old life and walk into a new one. So that's the second thing I think John is really getting at. As he's saying, eternal life is found in Christ. And if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your problem called sin, that he was raised from the dead to conquer sin and death one time for all time, then we can express our belief by turning around, repenting, following Jesus, and being baptized. We will be given and take hold of this gracious gift of eternal life and the grace of Jesus. That is what this is about. But the gospel is not just about getting out of hell, which is the third thing that this life is about. <laughs> because it is about a new life in Christ, all in all, right? It's about that, that once we are in Christ, we aren't who we once were. <laughs> The old is gone and the new has come. We are new creations, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Ephesians 2 says that we are his workmanship. Other translations say masterpiece, meaning that we are the most valuable created thing he has created. And we have been given a new life in Christ in order that we might walk in the good works that he prepared for us beforehand. Now, I know that there are a lot of people that want to take that somewhere that has to do with the guy that starts with Cal and ends with Vin, but it isn't about anything like that. What, 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 uh, what Paul is talking about in this idea of, of having works that are prepared for us beforehand is that these are the works we were prepared to do at the beginning of creation when he created human like beings to live and rule and have dominion with him. It's that our truest identity as image bearers of Christ is that we rule and reign with our God. And so he saves us and raises us up with him into the heavenly realms. This is, this is ruling and reigning language that we might walk in these good works that we were prepared to walk in beforehand. The only problem is sin got in the way. Jesus died to take care of our sin, not just so we could get out of hell, but so that we could bring heaven to earth by shining the light that comes with new life. See, we are called to walk in these good works and make the world a more Eden-like place. This is what a truly repentant and changed life looks like. Matthew 5, Jesus says this. He says, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand, and it gives light to all the house, and in the same way, your light, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is who we are to be. If we are saved, if we are redeemed, we are to be the light of the world that only comes through the life given to us in Christ. So the good news of Jesus is that he is the life, and he is the light, 
and we find life and are given a light to shine before men when we follow him and choose to be his disciples. But sadly, the two words, according to studies in our world right now, that most define Christians is irrelevant and extreme. And if light is dim, it's pretty irrelevant, right? And if it's extreme, it's pretty blinding and abrasive, isn't it? We need to be a light like Jesus talks about, that when you put it on a stand, it gives light to the whole house so everyone might see. We need to be a light that helpfully illuminates the darkness of our world so that people may be able to see Christ more clearly. So let me close with this. I know that many of you in the room um, have decided to follow Jesus before. You've already made that decision. You said, yeah, I'm going to follow Jesus. And you were baptized and you did the whole thing. My question is, is how is it going for you? Is there a light that's shining in you that others can clearly see and feel? Is there a light that illuminates the darkness of our world that leads people to really come closer to God? And Jesus. And maybe you can confidently say that there is a light, and that a light is alive and well in you. And I know some of you in the room, uh, to be honest, and your light is shining very brightly, and it's been very bright for me in dark times of my life, and I've seen it be very bright for others in dark times of their life. And I'm so grateful for that. But what... What if the light isn't very bright right now? What if it's dim right now? What if the darkness seems to have taken more of a hold as opposed to the light and life of Christ in you? It may sound oversimplified, especially considering what I told you you should do last week. (laughs) But if things are feeling dark, turn around. Turn around. Turn to be with Jesus. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. John Bunyan writes the excuses that we might bring John Bunyan is the writer of The Pilgrim's Progress. But he writes about this idea of of us not feeling like we can go back as prodigals. That we've wandered too far for the Father to accept us. He writes an entire book on this verse, Matthew 6, 37. And this is what he says will happen if we take Jesus at his word and come to him. With our excuses that sound like this. But I am a great sinner. Jesus says, I will never cast you out. But I'm an old sinner. Jesus says, I will never cast you out. But I am a hard-hearted sinner. And Jesus says, I will never cast you out. But I'm a backsliding sinner. But Jesus says, I will never cast you out. But I have served Satan all the days of my life. Jesus says, I will never cast you out. But I have sinned against the light. And Jesus says, I will never cast you out. But I have sinned against mercy. But Jesus says, I will never cast you out. But I have no good thing to bring. But Jesus says, I will never cast you out. Many of you may think that you've drifted too far. 
But if you'll turn around, if you'll repent and come back to him, he will never cast you out. He is a father of love and of grace and of mercy. And so maybe you don't need to make a decision to follow Jesus today. You just need to make a decision to return and rededicate your life to spend every day that you have left following him, taking hold of this gift of grace, this this gift of life, And let your light shine brightly before men. Come. Come back to the Father. Because he will never cast you out. But some of you in the room, you may, maybe you've never made a decision. You've never drawn a line in the sand. I mean, everything that sound like Je- everything about Jesus sounds good and it and it and it feels good but you've never like taken a stand to say I believe well do you want a new life do you want Jesus to give you this gift of grace Do you desire to live with him for eternity? Do you desire for your life to light up and shine brightly into the darkness? Be a beacon of hope for people who are hurting in our broken world. Then there's no better day than today to put your foot in the sand and draw a line and say, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back and be baptized. You can't see it, but the baptistry is right behind that curtain, and it is warm, and it is ready. (laughs) We already have baptisms planned for today. There are already people who have made a decision that they're going to draw the line in the sand today. No turning back. So you're not alone if that's you. You can come, even if it's the first time. No matter how old or how young, you can come. Make a decision. Say yes to Jesus. And you're like, well, I didn't come prepared for this. Well, we're prepared. We have everything you need. (laughs) We have everything you need. And we'll do whatever we can to help you make this decision because it is the best decision you could ever make in your life. So no matter what decision you feel like God's leading you to make, maybe you just, seriously, you just need to like rededicate and you need to like return home. Maybe you need to make a decision for the first time, whatever decision you want to make. I, I, I don't do this very often, but I would invite you to just come as you are and make whatever decision you feel like God's laid on your heart to make. I'm going to invite um, a few people to come sit with me on the front row um, at the end of this talk. And as we respond and take communion and we continue to worship and sing songs, I just want to invite you, you just come if you, if you have a decision to make. But also know today is not the end, right? If you don't make the decision today, you walk out of here without making a decision, you can always make a decision. You call me tomorrow on the phone, right? You can call a friend. You can call whoever. Any day, any time, we can help you make the decision to follow Jesus. So however you feel like God's leading you, just encourage you to just sit with that and respond appropriately, whatever, whatever you feel. Okay. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to take the bread and the cup and, uh, and give you a chance to make a decision, respond however you feel God's leading you to respond.